I, I know that, um, that there were, there were a few teachers and I know that there were a few classes that had uh, spring break. So if you're okay, we're just gonna go ahead and start and record this. Okay. Um, all good. All right, so am I good to get started then? Yeah, I'll, how about I introduce you and then uh, we'll go from there. So okay, good? yeah. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you again for joining us for another uh, the Purdue Lecture Hall series. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm Assistant Director of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And it is my honor today of introducing you to Molly Yost, PhD candidate in the Department of Medicinal Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology, uh, working under uh, advisor Dan Flaherty, uh, drug discovery for a very interesting bacteria called Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, and uh, it is such a pleasure of having you on today, Molly. I am so interested in the work that you're doing and I, we've had a chance to interact before and I'm just very much looking forward to this talk. So without further ado, please take it away. All right. Thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. Um, so as you mentioned, I will be talking a little bit about how I got into research and what led me to Purdue University um, and to the MCMP department here. Um, and then I will talk about what I do in the lab, what my research is, um, some of the research questions I have, and how I go about studying those questions to find the answers. So first, just to bring you up to speed about um, how I got to Purdue, um, I originally back in high school, I thought I wanted to be a pharmacist. Um, I thought it sounded like a really cool job. I wanted to be able to help people. And I was always interested in uh, the pharmaceutical industry um, to some degree. So during my senior year of high school, I shadowed in a couple of different pharmacies, um, a couple hours a day throughout one of my uh, last semesters at school, I would go to a pharmacy and uh, watch the pharmacists just in their day-to-day -day life on the job. And uh, I would do a little bit of pharmacy tech work to help fill prescriptions, things like that. And when it came time for me to apply to colleges, um, I thought, you know, maybe I want to go down this pharmacy road, um, but I wasn't quite sure. So I applied to some colleges with pharmacy programs and some without as well. And the one school that I really liked um, is it was Vassar College. So Vassar College um, is a small liberal arts school that does not have a pharmacy program. Um, so I decided instead to, of pursuing a uh, pre-pharmacy program or a six-year pharmacy school that I would go to Vassar instead, uh, and I majored in chemistry, and I thought, okay, I will uh, do four years at this college and get my degree in chemistry, and at the end of that, if I want to be a pharmacist, I can still go to pharmacy school, and if not, I will do something else with my chemistry degree. So that's what I did. I majored in chemistry and um, I worked at another pharmacy for a summer. Um, but then the following summer, I decided to stay on campus and do research in a chemistry lab with one of my professors. And throughout that summer, I realized I really enjoyed being in the chemistry lab and making molecules. And so then I started to think, you know, maybe this pharmacy, uh, becoming a pharmacist route wasn't really for me. And um, I realized from this research that I don't want to be the one who is at the counter at CVS, you know, handing out the drugs. Um, but I kind of want to be behind the scenes and be the one who makes the drugs. So that kind of led me to start looking at graduate schools and figure out what kind of programs I would maybe want to apply to that would let me be in a lab where I can be essentially making drugs. So um, from there, I found the Purdue NCMP department. Um, and I applied to a couple different schools that all had similar sounding departments, um, whether that be a PhD in uh, pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical sciences, pharmacology, things like that. But um, ultimately why I chose Purdue and the MCMP department is because um, medicinal chemistry and molecular pharmacology 
has such a wide range of applications in the lab and after graduation. Um, and the department specifically here has a lot of faculty and a lot of different areas of research. We have people who are studying viruses, bacteria, um, some people do more chemistry work, some um, do computer modeling or work with animal models um, or do research for cancer. So there were a lot of options at Purdue and that's something that I really appreciated. Um, and one of the reasons, like I mentioned, uh, why I chose Purdue because I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, but there were so many options here for me to explore. So once I got to Purdue, um, I did a couple rotations in a couple of different labs. And uh, as mentioned before, I ended up in a lab where I could study the bacteria Neisseria gonorrhea and um, how to make a drug to treat uh, the infection. So just to give a little background about what drug discovery really means, uh, there are four main stages of drug discovery. Um, and the first one is target identification. So once um, a lab or a professor, whoever is doing the research, decides what exactly what disease they want to target, for example, they want to figure out what target within that um, disease they want to go after. So in the case of my research, what I'll be talking about today is a protein called uh, carbonic anhydrase. So for short, NGCA, um, which is specifically the carbonic anhydrase in Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, and something else to think about for target identification is whether uh, we want to activate the target. So do we want to um, increase the activity of the target or do we want to inhibit it? And so in my case, for my target, um, I want to inhibit the NGCA so that it can no longer do its job. Um, so in order for that, um, in order to kill the bacteria, I want to inhibit the activity of this protein. Um, so specifically, as far as the drug discovery process goes, my research um, occurs in this second stage. So the drug discovery, as I mentioned. So this includes making molecules in the lab, um, just like you would in any sort of organic chemistry class you may have. Um, and then I test the molecules in vitro, which means um, I'm not working in animals or in humans. I'm just working, um, I'm testing molecules somehow in a test tube essentially, which I will get into. Um, and then we have parameters to evaluate how effective these molecules are. And this is an iterative process that I do. So I will make molecules, I'll test them, see how good they are um, against my target. And then I will go back and make more molecules and repeat the process. So later on down the road, um, these molecules may go into animal models and eventually humans, um, which is part of drug development before eventually um, going into clinical use. Um, so everything that I'll be mentioning today, my research specifically will be in this drug discovery stage. So the reason that this research is important um, and something that I, uh, really liked about this research is um, I wanted to be able to directly make an impact um, on people's health. And um, gonorrhea is an urgent public health threat. So Neisseria gonorrhea causes uh, the STI gonorrhea. Um, and there are several complications that can arise if a gonococcal infection goes untreated. This includes pelvic inflammatory disease and disseminated gonococcal infection where um, the bacteria spreads throughout uh, the bloodstream and into the entire body. Um, and gonorrhea is becoming more and more common in the US and worldwide. As you can see on the left here, um, from 2010 to 2019, there has been a pretty steady increase in uh, reported cases of gonorrhea. Um, and it is estimated that there are even more gonorrhea cases that go unreported because a lot of times um, people who are infected don't have any symptoms. So we don't really know how many people do have gonorrhea. Um, but the biggest problem with having gonorrhea is drug resistance. So uh, I'm sure you've heard about antibiotic resistance and um, how this is becoming a growing problem for many different bacterias. Um, and what this slide shows essentially is that over time, there have been 
many different drugs used to treat gonorrhea. And for the most part, all of them um, have the gonorrhea, the bacteria has developed a resistance against these antibiotics. So that's kind of where I come in and where my research comes in. Um, my main goal is to address this problem of antibiotic resistance. Um, I want to make new drugs that the bacteria does not have a resistance for in order to treat the infection and kill the bacteria. So my two um, main research questions that I'll be talking about today is how can we make drugs that can be used to treat gonorrhea? And then how can we test these drugs to, de to determine how effective they are um, and how effective they will be eventually in humans? So circling back to um, my target that I mentioned earlier is um, Neisseria gonorrhea carbonic anhydrase. And these proteins, carbonic anhydrases, are found in eukaryotes. So as humans, we have our own carbonic anhydrases. Uh, they also are in, are in algae and bacteria. And these proteins are important for physiological processes. They maintain the pH in our cells. Um, and they maintain carbon dioxide homeostasis. So proteins essentially um, help this reaction where we have carbon dioxide and water going to bicarbonate and a hydrogen proton. And so if we're able to stop this reaction from happening in Neisseria gonorrhea, the cells won't be able to uh, survive and the infection won't be able to spread. So the way that this reaction works is that water is able to interact with this zinc ion. Uh, and this zinc ion is present in uh, the carbonic anhydrase in Neisseria gonorrhea. And so um, in the presence of carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide will interact with the zinc molecule and the water molecule to then produce this uh, bicarbonate and this hydrogen proton. So this all occurs because of the interaction with this zinc ion. If we are able to block this zinc ion here, then the water won't be able to interact with it. And if the water and carbon dioxide can't interact with this zinc ion, the reaction cannot occur. So that is my main um, approach. I want to be able to inhibit or block this zinc ion um, so that this reaction doesn't happen inside the bacteria. So there are already drugs approved um, for humans. Um, so these two drugs, ethoxolamide or EZM and acetazolamide or AZM are used. Um, they're already FDA approved and they target the human carbonic anhydrase. Uh, so this works inside humans to treat things like glaucoma and epilepsy. And as you can see here, this is um, a computer model of what it looks like when EZM and AZM are interacting with the zinc ion. And what you'll notice in both cases is that the same part of each drug interacts with the zinc molecule. So that is this um, SO2NH2, it's called a sulfonamide. And so when this sulfonamide in the drug interacts with the zinc ion, uh, the protein is no longer able to do its job. So this is um, something that I adopted into my own research. Um, basically, I wanted to see how can we take the structures of these two drugs and modify them so that instead of targeting the um, carbonic anhydrase in humans, they target and inhibit my target protein and GCA. So um, to do this, like I mentioned, um, I want all of my molecules to have this sulfonamide feature as well, because I already know that the sulfonamide is what inhibits uh, the zinc and the proton from working. However, I still want to figure out how can I make drugs that are um, effective against the human carbonic anhydrase and change their structure somehow so that they bind to the bacterial one, uh, protein instead of the human protein. And so the way that I go about doing this is that I do chemistry on this part of these two molecules. And so um, you can have a better visual of why this is important or how this makes it selective. Um, if you've ever heard of the lock and key 
um, mechanism in which a substrate binds to an enzyme. We have the enzyme here that has a specific binding pocket and then a substrate or a molecule that fits inside of the enzyme uh, binding pocket. So taking this lock and key um, theory, um, we can do the same thing with the human carbonic anhydrase and Neisseria gonorrhea carbonic anhydrase. So as you can see, this is acetazolamide, the AZM, one of the drugs that is effective against the human, human carbonic anhydrase. And you can see it fits perfectly or almost perfectly inside uh, the binding site. However, we know that uh, NGCA has a binding site that is similar, but not quite the same. So um, the shape is about the same size, but it's a little bit bigger. Um, and this drug, which looks like AZM, except it has this, um, this hexagon attached to it, fits better inside the binding pocket. The binding pocket of NGCA is different. However, if we try to fit that same molecule inside the human protein, it wouldn't fit. So um, if we are able to find molecules that essentially fit very well inside the NGCA binding pocket, but do not fit well inside the human carbonic anhydrase binding pocket, we will be able to uh, have a selectivity. We will be able to have drugs that bind and inhibit NGCA, but don't bind and inhibit the HCA. So that's the main theory for the drugs that I make. Um, but the next step would be, we have to figure out how effective they are against uh, the protein, the target NGCA, but then also against the bacteria itself. And so there are two ways that we go about doing that for the most part. The one is we are first testing molecules just versus the protein. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the protein is responsible for this reaction from happening. So um, in order to figure out how effective the molecules are, what we do is we um, have a solution that has um, the molecules, the protein, and carbon dioxide. And eventually over time, we can see how much of this HCO3 is produced. So we know that if the protein is working like it's supposed to, there will be HCO3 that is produced. However, if the molecules are working and they inhibit the carbonic anhydrase from working, there won't be any HCO3 produced. So that's how we can figure out how well the molecule is working against the protein. The other thing we can do is see how well the molecules work against the bacteria as a whole. And so to do this, we grow bacteria and then we essentially mix the bacteria and the drug at different concentrations. And when we do that, we can see that um, when you add a certain concentration or a certain amount of drug, eventually the bacteria will stop growing. So from there, we can figure out a parameter that's called the MIC. And this minimum inhibitory concentration is how we can figure out how well a certain molecule works and stops the bacteria from growing. So in my lab, um, I, along with some of my lab mates, we have made um, many different molecules that all look like AZM. However, they have um, some differences and we have tested them to see how well they work against the protein and the bacteria. So um, in this table, we are looking at the KIs of the molecule. And what that means is it's a parameter to measure how well a molecule works against the protein. Um, and we want the KI number to be as small as possible. The smaller uh, the number is, the better the drug is. Um, and essentially, we can think about this kind of um, as how much drug we would need to ingest in order for the protein to be blocked inside our body. And so when we think about um, taking an ibuprofen or um, any medicine, we think about, um, you know, maybe we're taking 500 milligrams or for some things um, we take even less of that, like a Xanax, we might take five milligrams, things like that. So we want this KI number to be as low as possible because we don't want to have to ingest a lot of the drug in order for it to work. So as you can see, AZM, which again um, is designed and is used to work against HCA, has a pretty low KI for the human protein of 12.5, 
So it's not as effective against the bacterial protein. However, molecules 21 and 29 have very low um, KIs against NGCA and not as low against the human protein. So what that means is that 20, not, 21 and 29 would be great candidates for drugs because they are selective for um, inhibiting the bacterial protein and not the human protein. However, 40 and 48 have high KIs against NGCA and low KIs against the human carbonic anhydrase. So 40 and 48 essentially are not good uh, candidates for drugs against Neisseria gonorrhea. Then we can also look, uh, as I mentioned, at how well the molecules work against the bacteria as a whole. And so again, we want the minimum inhibitory concentration to be as low as possible. And as you can see, 22 and 29 also have um, pretty low MICs, so uh, as well as 19. So these drugs, um, essentially, we don't need a lot of drug in, to be used in order to kill the bacteria and stop it from growing. Um, however, 58 and 59 are not so effective against the bacteria, so they wouldn't make as good as drugs. So something interesting that we noticed while we were making these drugs and testing them is that some of them would be very effective against the protein on its own, but once we put it into the bacteria, it wasn't as effective. So for an example, we can see 10 and 82 look pretty similar. Their structures are almost uh, the exact same, just a slight difference here. And they both, as you can see from their KIs, are about the same as far as blocking um, the protein from working. However, we noticed that when we tested each molecule against the bacteria, 10, compound 10, is no longer effective because it has a high MIC. However, 82 has a very low MIC. So 82 is effective against the bacteria, but 10 is not. And this is something that we saw with um, a couple different molecules. So uh, 68 and 29 are also pretty similar to each other. Uh, the only difference being 68 has a nitrogen here and a fluorine here. But again, what we saw is that uh, 68 and 29 were both effective against the target protein, but 68 was not effective against the bacteria where 29 was. So this led us to question why can some protein or why can some drugs inhibit the carbonic anhydrous protein but are not effective against the bacterial cell? And our hypothesis was um, maybe these drugs cannot get into the bacteria. So if they can't get into the bacteria, they can't um, do their job to stop the bacteria from growing. So to test this, um, we developed an experiment to see how much drug is actually getting into the Neisseria gonorrhea. So um, there have been publications and labs in the past that have figured out there are certain properties or rules that a drug must have in order to get into E. coli. Um, and so E. coli and gonorrhea are both gram-negative bacteria. So for a drug to get into the bacteria, it first has to pass through an outer membrane that has um, something called a porin. And this porin is essentially a tunnel that the drug has to get through. Once it gets through the porin, it still has to cross an inner membrane in order to reach the inside of the, the bacteria. So we know that there are certain properties that a drug must have in order to effectively get into E. coli. However, it is not known if there are rules or properties that a drug must have to accumulate inside the bacteria that I'm studying, Neisseria gonorrhea. However, it is known that the tunnel between um, E. coli and gonorrhea is different. Um, so from there, we had a hypothesis that um, mo any molecule that can get through E. coli and enter the bacteria um, doesn't necessarily mean it can get into Neisseria gonorrhea. So we wanted to figure out how can we predict or make rules for drugs to be able to tell if a drug can get into the um, gonorrhea in order to do its job. 
So this, um, from here, we made something, we developed an experiment called an accumulation assay in which we were going to be able to measure how much drug actually accumulates in the bacteria. So to do this, uh, we would grow Neisseria gonorrhea and then we would add our molecule or um, our drug into this test tube that has uh, the bacteria in it. From there, we um, would allow it to incubate in order to give the drug time to enter the bacteria. And then we centrifuge it, which means that we take this test tube and we spin it very quickly. And what that does is allow us to separate any drug that is inside the bacteria from any drug that is outside the bacteria. We then get rid of any drug that did not accumulate. And then we break apart the bacteria or we lyse it. So from there, we are able to spin um, or centrifuge the bacteria again. And from there, any drug that was on inside of the bacteria is now um, in this upper layer. So what we can do with that is put it on a machine called an LCMS. And what that does is it allows us to quantify how much drug was actually inside the bacteria. So from there, we could figure out essentially um, if a drug very easily got inside the bacterial cell or whether it was unable to penetrate the outer membrane and the inner membrane to get inside and do its job. So um, some preliminary results from this assay, this experiment that we developed, as you can see, um, over time, AZM does not accumulate very much inside um, Neisseria gonorrhea. However, on the other hand, EZM, uh, this molecule, does have high accumulation. So what that means is that um, EZM, when we um, put that inside the test tube with the bacteria, a lot of the drug was getting inside uh, Neisseria gonorrhea so that it could work. However, we did not see the same thing with AZM. And if we look at our MICs, we see that uh, this has a correlation. So AZM is not very effective at getting inside the bacteria, and it also has a high MIC, meaning it um, isn't super effective against uh, killing or inhibiting the growth of the bacteria, whereas EZM easily gets inside the bacteria, and it also has a very low MIC. So not only does it accumulate more in the bacteria, but it is also more effective in stopping uh, the bacteria from growing. So from there, um, we are going to test all of our molecules and we hope to see some sort of um, pattern or trend, uh, any sort of rules that will allow us to figure out um, why certain molecules can get inside the bacteria and why certain molecules cannot get inside the bacteria. And from there, we want to be able to use that to predict how effective a drug may be. So if we can do that, we can synthesize more molecules um, that we can predict will be effective. So um, that's one of the main experiments um, that I have been working on besides um, just doing chemistry. Um, another experiment that I've been looking at, another way to um, assess how effective or how good our molecules are against the protein is to figure out how quickly drugs uh, bind to uh, the NGCA, so how quickly it gets to that zinc ion, and then how long it stays there before it dissociates and leaves the zinc ion in the protein. So to do this, um, I do a method called surface plasmin resonance, or SPR. And so the way that this works um, is we have a uh, little chip here that essentially we can attach our protein to. So um, I attach the protein to this chip that then goes inside this um, SPR machine, this instrument. And essentially what's happening inside the instrument is we take our drug that we want to test and we see how quickly it binds to the protein. And from there, we get a value called the K-on. And like I said, the K-on is a parameter that measures how quickly the molecule binds. So we want uh, a favorable drug to have um, a small K-on. We want it to quickly bind 
to the molecule. Then we can also look at how quickly the molecules leave the protein, as I mentioned. So that gives us a K off, how quickly the molecule dissociates. So we hope that the molecule stays bound to uh, the protein for a while so that it can inhibit uh, the protein and stop NGCA from doing its job uh, for as long as possible. And from there, we get um, curves that look like this. And essentially, um, we can get this measurement of a KD. And a KD measures the binding or the affinity of a molecule. So this is another way that we are able to test how good our molecules are against the protein itself. Um, we want to be able to find molecules that have very good binding against the protein so that um, it is able to inhibit the protein from doing its job for as long as possible and as quickly as possible. So in conclusion, um, essentially what I do in the lab is uh, I make molecules that um, are potent against the bacterial protein, NGCA. Um, and then some of these molecules are also potent against the bacteria itself. So they have great antibacterial effects so that um, the bacteria cannot continue to grow and uh, spread infection. And um, a lot of these molecules are also selective for NGCA. So they are more likely to bind and inhibit the protein of the bacteria instead of the uh, proteins that we have as humans. Um, essentially, um, we are also looking at accumulation in the drug in, or in the bacteria to figure out how much drug can get inside the bacteria. And then lastly, we use uh, SPR to analyze how quickly the molecules associate and bind to the protein, and then how long it takes for the molecules to dissociate from the protein. Um, so that's essentially what I am doing in the lab every day. Um, if there are any questions about um, figuring out, you know, what you want to study in college or graduate school, uh, if you have any more questions about what a medicinal chemist does or what they can do, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Here's my email, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have about my research, um, research in general, any chemistry questions, um, anything like that. I would be happy to answer. Awesome. Thank you so much, Molly. That, that was great, great talk. <laughs> and uh, so interesting. What a, what a wonderful journey. I have a few questions. I hope you don't mind if, yeah. if I do ask, and I'll <laughs> open it also to Robin if she has any questions. Um, I was very interested, obviously, in the science part. And it, it's, so, it's so cool to see this aspect of drug discovery, which is at a university. I think most people think that drug discovery happens in a big company like Merck and Pfizer and Lilly and Moderna. They might have heard these names more recently. But it's incredible the work that you're doing at the university to maybe, you know, pull teas apart what really we should be investing. Do you have any idea? Let's say you figure out it's some derivative of EZM. Do you have any idea what needs to, like how much more research would need to take place before we can deliver this new drug to a patient uh, in the hospital? Sure. Um, so I can uh, kind of go back to um, this slide as far as the stages go. Um, something that is very fortunate about uh, the kind of research model that I'm using is that um, a lot of times, as you can see in the drug discovery phase, uh, you have to do tests for toxicity and safety. Um, and then also more um, trials, uh, you may think of, you know, a, a drug trial, things like that, um, in the clinic with humans as well. Uh, so one of the advantages of using EZM and AZM is that, um, we already know that they are pretty safe. They don't have high toxicity. Um, they can be given out to people in large doses without any, um, 
side effects. So whereas some drugs, you know, sometimes uh, in a lab at a university or in a company, um, a drug may work great against the bacteria or the illness, whatever it may be. Um, but once it gets into humans, it uh, has terrible side effects. So um, although we would still, um, we would have to work with collaborators who do do animal tests to see if it's uh, a drug derivative that I make is safe against an animal before eventually getting to see if it's safe against humans. Um, we do hypothesize that our molecule um, would be generally safe and have low toxicity. Um, so that's an advantage about using uh, these drug scaffolds that are already being used against humans. Um, other things that we have to think about is um, the solubility of a molecule, um, other properties to make sure, again, that once it gets inside um, a body, it's able to still do its job. Um, so that is something that we have to eventually figure out. Um, and there are tests that we would have to do, or we would um, send the drug to collaborators who would do that in order to figure out um, if the drug gets ingested, um, will it be metabolized, for example, or will it still be able to reach the bacteria um, once it's inside an infected human? Yeah, and and definitely a lot to consider. I I really I I think you paint a very broad picture of options and follow up experimentation that needs to take place to make sure that the drug is effective enough and not toxic or not doesn't uh, cause collateral damage to other tissues or, or other unintended consequences of that. Um, I, I would like the audience to understand that it takes, I mean, you're doing your PhD and that takes about five to six years if you're really good and diligent, but it takes, my gosh, to develop a drug from the beginning, even if you're taking a scaffold that you have and you're decorating it with different um, molecules, different chemistries to see if you can make it better, to see if you can make it more soluble, to see if you can make it penetrate or stick to that molecule a little bit more. I mean, it, from here, it could take another 10, 12, 15 years and another $2 billion, right? right. Like yeah. uh, I, that's, that's the reality. Even though we might have a starting scaffold, we still have to go and test to make sure that it's safe enough uh, for public uh, consumption distribution. Yeah, and that's Mo something, yeah, that's something that I hoped um, to kind of illustrate through this um, schematic is that my research personally um, is pretty early on into uh, the drug discovery process, right? Um, yeah. So, you know, my research is taking about five years to complete, and I hope that I find a great drug. Um, but then from there, the next steps, such as looking at the toxicity and the safety, um, things like that, that, that may be someone else's PhD um, that takes another five years. And then, you know, eventually uh, someone else's, you know, research goes into looking at, you know, uh, humans or uh, things like that. So yeah, my, as far as the scope of um, starting from a, uh, identifying a target um, towards a drug that goes on the market, my research is just a small slice of the entire process. <laughs> Absolutely. And very much at the infancy stages, right? Like we, yeah. even, even if you make a, even if you make a drug or what uh, chemistry in the lab, we shouldn't really call it a drug until uh, we, we are sure that we can actually use it as a drug, right? Otherwise mm -hmm. it's, it's so many years away and perhaps many iterations away from becoming a drug, right? Yeah. What did it what did it take to turn Tylenol and Advil to a pill that can sit on your shelf at room temperature mm -hmm. 
for years and still works after you bring out that bottle. It's an amazing feat of uh, solid state chemistry that needs to happen after we, we know what the biological effects are of these chemistries, right? Robin, yeah, you had absolutely. a question? Yeah, my question was, so once you, you finish your PhD and you're, you, you move on to the next stage of your life, where, where do you see this research? Do you take this, what you've learned here to your next um, job, I guess? Do you, right. take that, you take that with you? So essentially, um, I will take uh, maybe the, the methods that I used, um, the knowledge that I've gained, but as far as, um, the actual research, I won't be able to continue working on this project once, um, I finish graduation, graduation. Um, so yeah, after graduation, um, I do hope to go into the pharmaceutical industry. Um, most people getting their PhD, uh, it's either one of two options. You either go into academia where, um, you can eventually work at a university and have your own lab with your own grad students, or, um, you go to the pharmaceutical industry and, you know, you do the same type of maybe drug discovery. Um, however, I do hope to go into industry and, um, use the knowledge that I've gained from my research um, and apply it towards a new project, a new bacteria, um, new drug discovery. Um, but I'll be leaving specifically making these drugs um, okay. behind. <laughs> oh, how fascinating. The adventure mm -hmm. continues, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, who knows where it unfolds? But definitely those techniques and the knowledge you know, I think what people also um, don't realize is that the training that you get in your PhD is very much how to think critically, how to, how to take any problem that you have and start taking it apart into bit by bit so that you can start tackling. And I think you, you take a lot of that with you. Tell us a little bit about Vassar College. I was very mm -hmm. intrigued by that because you said something that was key to me. And you said, you know, I wanted to go into pharmacy practice, but Vassar didn't have that, but I really liked it. And so I went there. Mm -hmm. Is it really location, 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 as they say, or... Did you really, what, did it matter where you went? You thought you would have gotten a similar experience or was it that Vassar gave you that confidence to say, yeah, you know, this is good place. I'm gonna learn good chemistry and I feel good here. So I like to come, I like to participate. <laughs> I like to be here. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I think, um, no matter where I would have ended up, I probably um, would have come to the same conclusion that I want to study um, a pharmaceutical sciences or medicinal chemistry to some capacity um, in the future. Um, but the reason that I chose Vassar is um, I really prioritized kind of just the overall feel and community um, of the school. And I didn't really realize how important that was until I visited the school. Um, and I met students who were there. I um, was able to kind of just get a feel for um, the community that's on campus. And um, I really appreciated being at a smaller school um, just because my professors all knew me personally. Um, and that was something that I really valued. Um, I was able to work closely with my research advisor on my project um, over that summer. And then as I wrote a um, senior thesis before graduation. Um, however, there are great opportunities at big universities too. Um, you know, working at a, or going to um, undergraduate at a school like Purdue is great because you have um, huge research labs that you can work on that work in that have grad students and postdocs and lab techs. Um, so that definitely gives you, I think, a better idea of what research can look like um, in the future. 
Um, but for me, my research, I only had other undergraduate students and um, the research advisor, my professor, who was in the lab with me. So um, I think there's advantages and disadvantages to um, small schools and big schools kind of just depends, you know, what what you're after, what uh, is a priority to you. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> that's great. And I, I totally agree with you. You know, you have to feel comfortable with your situation. Otherwise, it's difficult to want to participate and want to do things. Molly, if somebody wanted to get started with research in their undergrad, let's say they got to Purdue or any other university and they wanted to start, what would you recommend that they do to get going? Yeah, um, the first thing I would do is go on to um, the university faculty website, whatever it is, um, once you figure out, you know, maybe you are doing really well in your biology class and you think, okay, I really like biology, maybe this is something that I want to, um, you know, look into pursuing in the future. Um, it could be as easy as going on to the um, biology department website and just reading through um, the list of faculty members and seeing what specifically each faculty member specializes in. Um, and once you do that, you can um, just reach out to a couple of professors, email them, ask them if they are willing to talk to you more about their research, um, where you can ask questions and ask if they um, are looking for undergraduate researchers to be in the lab. Um, I think really just reaching out and asking um, is important because you never know um, what professors, you know, might be interested in having you join the lab or maybe just going to talk to them um, just to see kind of what different areas of research might look like. Um, so that's something that I kind of figured out as I was looking at graduate schools, um, as I was going to these different schools to visit and talk to the professors there, um, just asking professors and having conversations with them, you know, what exactly are you researching? Or, um, oh, you are looking at lung cancer. Can you explain to me like how you do that in your lab? Just so I could learn um, about all the different opportunities. Um, and yeah, I think in undergrad, just, emailing a professor whose research you think sounds really cool um, and just asking. Uh, yeah, the opportunities are there. You just have to pursue them. Absolutely. And, you know, I remember being scared, though, to go and approach a prof and ask questions. Um, how do I get that courage? What, like, what, what frame of mind do I need to be in? Because <laughs> I know it's pretty daunting. And yeah. Scary. Um, and sometimes emails, my emails would get ignored. <laughs> so what what right. do I do? Yeah, I think something that's comforting is knowing that um, the professors who are doing their research, they're doing it because they are really passionate about it. Um, and so, yes, professors are busy. You know, maybe sometimes an email goes unnoticed, it gets buried in their inbox. Um, so I think there's no harm in, you know, reaching out again and just um, something that I learned is that since they're very excited about their research and their science, they want people who uh, feel the same way. So even if you don't have the experience, even if you've never worked in a lab before, even if you don't even know, you know, how to do a single chemical reaction, they want to see that enthusiasm and the same passion uh, that they have for their research. So I think just showing interest. Um, and I found that a lot of times professors, if you show engagement and interest, they will be more than happy to talk about this thing that they are passionate about. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Ask questions, right? Ask lots of questions and show that interest. You know, I would say also feel free to, uh, to make appointments with them and 
and make time to go and meet with them and see if you like them too, because you know, you need to have some chemistry with these people as well too, right? Meaning, yeah. you know, like you need to like them and they need to like you. It needs to be a mutual agreement there. Yes, showing interest is good, uh, but there needs to be a good camaraderie there so that there's good communication and that there is trust and, and a, a great relationship that is formed there. As much as mental relationship and these are still advisors right at the end of the day it's going to be your PhD thesis it's your proposal it's your uh, article that you're writing um, and these people are advising you this is wonderful Molly what um, what do you think you know you said you're you're going into the the but you want to go into the pharmaceutical industry. Um, how are you going to approach that as you as you move now? I know you're totally focused on your thesis now, and you're totally focused on maybe getting some publications underway. How do you then transition to start looking for a job in in pharmaceutical industry? Do you have some leads already that you're looking or is this something that you're still thinking about and planning? Yeah, this is something um, that I am still thinking about and uh, trying to figure out, yeah, where exactly um, my journey will take me next. Um, I think something that uh, I've been trying to make more of an effort to do is just find opportunities to talk to people about their experiences. Um, so for example, a couple weeks ago, um, there were three um, employees of a company who were visiting Purdue's campus to talk to a professor um, and meet with them about um, a piece of equipment that the professor was using or a study that they were doing. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but since these employees from the pharmaceutical industry were on campus, uh, the professor that they were meeting with asked um, if they would be willing to talk to grad students about what they do, um, just to give some insight. And so I went to that talk and it was uh, really informative and just, it was really nice to just hear from um, these employees in the industry, how they got there um, and just to hear their experiences. So I think just, uh, trying to build a network of people and take advantages of opportunities um, anytime there's, you know, a visitor on campus or a seminar um, of a speaker that sounds really interesting to me, just going to that. Um, and there's uh, the uh, career development office as well that always has talks and seminars and visitors coming. Um, so just taking opportunities like that to try to figure out, you know, maybe um, what type of company I would want to go to, you know, what I want to go to a big biotech company or um, a small startup, things like that. Um, so as of now, I'm not really sure where exactly I'll end up uh, trying to keep my options open and learn a little bit more about, um, again, like the, the environment that I want to be in. Definitely. Definitely. So neat. Uh, Molly, I want to thank you so much for taking time to speak to us today. Tell us a little bit about your story, letting us peer into your life a little bit and tell us a little bit about your ambition and, and where you want to go uh, with your career. It's very exciting to meet somebody like you uh, that has a lot going and is really one of our science heroes here at Purdue. So thank you so much for thank taking you. time to yeah, speak to you. us at the Purdue Lecture Hall series and Best, best wishes to you and, and your research. And again, um, I hope uh, that uh, we can stay in touch and follow your trajectory as uh, you move through your career and we watch you uh, succeed in your next steps. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You.